Justin like a young pop right style. Justin Tins, wow. Monica McNutt, June Lee, Mina Kimes, I'm Sarah Spain, filling in for Tony Reality. Let's go around the horn. Fifty-nine. All right, let's <laughs> let's talk some baseball. Astros tie up the World Series in a game of peace last night. Jose Altuve, two for five with a home run. His 22nd postseason dinger. That ties him with former Yankees great Bernie Williams for second most all time. Only Manny Ramirez has more. June, did the Astros take back the upper hand in the series? I think they basically even the series out. I mean, it's really important for Jose Altuve to get off on the right foot because he's the catalyst for that Astros lineup. He came into last night hitting 178 in the postseason so far. And I think it's also going to be really important for that Houston offense generally to keep going because teams who out homer this postseason are 22 and 1. And so it's one of those things where, you know, Houston has obviously struggled in game one. I think that's a bit of an anomaly in terms of their performance over the course of this entire postseason. And the fact that Max Fried was the guy on the mound for Atlanta, that's definitely a cause for concern because that is their best best and most talented pitcher on that team. Mina Kimes, June Lee, uh, astutely said they basically evened the series. They literally evened the series. Uh, what else did you make of the Astros taking the win last night? Uh, I'll add to that incredible analysis. You asked about whether they have the upper hand. I'll say they have the upper pinky, maybe? I mean, it, it is very close. June isn't wrong. Um, but I think Houston going forward has an advantage, not because of the hitting, although you're right to say that the hitting bouncing back is huge. Uh, on both sides, I think the lineups are fairly comparable and fairly boom or bust. This is actually the, only the sixth time, Sarah, in the history of the World Series that teams have traded four-run leads, which is wow. remarkable. For me, it, it, it's more about the pitch. Uh, you know, Charlie Morton, that, that was an incredible, gutting performance. But now we're kind of assessing the wreckage. And for Atlanta, it's not good. Mm -hmm. They really needed more out of Max Fried because after game three, they're going to have to go with back-to-back -back bullpen games. That's why I lean Houston, even though I don't lean dramatically. <laughs> Justin Tinsley, it's a 1-1 series. You make anything more of that win or are we just even Stevens? Look, Atlanta did what they were supposed to do. They split on the road. And I want to say this about Freed. I know he gave up a lot of runs, but all five hits in that second inning were grounders, and only one was hard hit. So it wasn't like he was getting drilled. If I'm, if I'm Atlanta, I'm looking at game three. This is a pivotal game. In the World Series, in the history, when it's tied 1-1, one, one, the winner of game three wins mm -hmm. nearly 70% of the time. So for Atlanta, it's about Ian Anderson, Ian Anderson, a young pitcher. He ha he has to uh, play well in game three. He he's 3-0 and with a 1.47 ERA. And I know this sounds trivial, but Atlanta can't let Houston score first. Teams in the postseason are 26-7 and when they do that, and Houston's 6-0 and when they score first. That's a pretty big deal to me. Monica, what did you make of the Astros evening things up? Well, I think that the Astros do have an upper hand. We keep talking about the totality of this roster. And then I think continuity is huge. They've got four players that include Altuve that have been together for 41 postseason wins and 69 games total. And so to me, mm -hmm. you look at that, the continuity, the experience, and I'm a huge fan of Dusty Baker as potentially being the X Factor if this thing goes wire to wire. Hash I appreciate you reminding us that there's a bunch of Astros players who have played a bunch together in the postseason. I don't know if I've heard much about Gee that storyline, but there's a couple of them who've been Jeez. here before. June, mm. tell me what the big story of this series has been so far for you. It's the fact that Atlanta has, you know, continued to play well despite you know this season where they've had all this chaoticism even last night they still fought back Max Free even after struggling in that first couple of innings he came back and pitched decently well after after struggling at the beginning of the game and so I think there's a lot of fight in this Atlanta team. I think there's a lot of interesting players. Uh, Austin Riley has been awesome this entire year. It would be great for him, for, for the Braves, to see him play better. Um, but I still think that this th this series is going to go seven games. You know, you went to Cornell, too, so I'm not going to ding you on chaoticism. I think the word's just chaos, but I'm not sure because <laughs> you're so smart and you predicted 59 points that I'm just going to let it be for now. We'll do some research <laughs> at the break. Let's move on. Spicy uh, Spain. <laughs> Thursday night used to be must-see TV. Friends, Seinfeld, ER. Before that, we got Family Ties, Cheers, Night Court. You guys all remember Night Court. You, of course. You know what? Every single one of you, Blank Stairs, Bull, Roz, nobody, no one. How did we get to a place where Mina Kimes is the oldest person on this panel? Y'all, okay. I'm upset. Unfair. All right, Thursday night football, usually not must-see TV, <laughs> but it is this week, even without some of the biggest names. We got the 7-0 Cardinals hosting the 6-1 Packers. 
first time since the 1970 merger that two teams with at least 13 combined wins meet in week eight or earlier. So for the cards, we got no J.J. Watt. For the pack, no Devontae Adams, no Alan Lazard, no D coordinator, Joe Barry. Mina, for this game, just tonight, who'd you rather have, Rodgers or Murray? Well, after you referenced my seniority, not my age, I prefer, prefer to it that way. I almost want to go with Rodgers, but undeniably, you'd rather be Kyler Murray in this one. And not just because of the complement of weapons at his disposal, which I'm sure my colleagues will talk about, but because of the defense he's facing, Sarah. Again, you know, the Packers defense last week held Washington to 10 points. Seems great until you watch the game and you see that outside the red zone, Taylor Heineke was moving the ball at will on them. Now, here comes... Kyler Murray to town to the MVP candidate. I just don't think it's going to well, go well for them on defense. Yeah, running uh, quarterbacks have been a real problem for them, and Kyler Murray comes in to make things worse. Justin Tinsley, who you got, Rodgers or Murray? It seems sacrilegious to pick against Aaron Rodgers, but for one game just days before Halloween in October, not January, but in October, I'm definitely picking Kyler Murray. Look, the point differential for the cards this year has been 111 points. The point differential for the Packers has been 22. And, and as Mina just said, the cards are stocked on offense for weapons for Kyler Murray. Meanwhile, the Packers right now, they're pretty much down bad. And look, here's another reason I like Kyler Murray. Against the zone and against the blitz, he's, he's been the best quarterback in football this year. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely picking Kyler Murray in one game. I'm starting to sense some pandering for the Bears fan that no one is choosing Aaron Rodgers. Monik Nutt, are you going with the rest of the panel here as well? I, I got you, Spain. Okay. I'm taking Aaron Rodgers in this okay. one. And yes, the stats are dazzling, and Kyler Murray's had an impressive year. And although sometimes running quarterbacks pro- uh, pose some problems for their lines, he's got a great handle on when to run and when to sit still this year. But we're still talking about Aaron Rodgers, and I know he's going to be missing Devontae Adams. But when you really dig into the numbers, his QBR is actually higher in games when he hasn't had Devontae Adams as a weapon. I just think this version of Aaron Rodgers, who has been surly and satirical and listening to everything, is salivating for this moment to think to knock off a team that's uh, undefeated so far in the season. As someone who's been on the other side of him trying to make a statement and then literally making a statement, uh, <laughs> he definitely knows when to show up. This could be one of them. June, they do have a great record, a winning record when they play without Devontae Adams. So are you taking that into account when you decide Rodgers or Murray tonight? I mean, when you factor in all the wide receivers that are down with with COVID right now with the Packers, I would also have to go with Kyler Murray. And everyone's been mentioning the fact that Kyler Murray is a running quarterback. He's running less this year than he ever has before in the previous three years of his career so far. I, I think, you know, on top of, you know, having Christian Kirk, having a guy like Zach Ertz added to the mix mm-hmm. now, uh, Kyler Murray's maturing his approach at the quarterback position and he's been able to scramble and create plays while also not kind of uh, kind of leaning on that that running and, and just using his speed to to make something out of nothing. Yeah, they've been actually a really balanced team despite the, the, the conversation coming in being all about the air raid. We've seen a lot of the run and the pass. Mina Kimes, is this a bigger game for either of these teams? I'd say Arizona in this case, um, with all due respect to your Bears, Green Bay is going to run away with that division. Wow. What's at stake for Arizona is the number one seed in the conference, and we know that comes with the bye now. You're the only team that gets a bye, so it's enormous. I think if they win this, they have a really, really good shot at right, walking away with that. I'd like to apologize to the Cardinals for what just happened, because I'm pretty sure Aaron Rodgers is going to tear it up tonight after all of that. <laughs> oh. um, let's take a look beyond tonight, though, because I want to talk about J.J. Watt's absence and how that might impact this fantastic Arizona team long term. He started all 80 games in his first five seasons, but he has struggled to stay healthy since. If he is indeed done, he's trying to get a second opinion, but if he's done, it'll be the fourth time in the past six seasons he's suffered a season-ending injury. So, Mino, what does this mean for the Cardinals going forward? Well, first I'll say this is just absolutely brutal for J.J. Watt. Getting the chance to play on a legitimate Mm. Super Bowl contender, having this kind of injury, you really feel for him. You also feel for this Arizona team because Watt has been incredibly disruptive this season. It's been a little bit of a renaissance for him, quite frankly. And you can't just look at sacks. You have to watch his performance. He's so disruptive on the inside of that defensive line. Actually third in the NFL in pass rush win rate. ESPN's metric that looks at how often defensive linemen beat their blockers. (laughs) So it's a huge loss, even though they've got some decent depth. Mina's favorite stat, and she got it in. I appreciate it. That <laughs> Tinsley, JJ Watt probably out for the rest of the season. What does this mean for the Cardinals? Man, this really sucks for JJ Watt. I feel terrible for him, and I feel for this Arizona team who has legit title aspirations. Uh, 
as Mina just said, it, his stats probably won't blow you out of the water when you look at him on paper, but like he was really disruptive within that system. He, he was really gelling well within that. But unfortunately, as you as you just mentioned in the lead up to this, this is nothing new. So, so now when I look at Arizona, I look at people like Marcus Golden, who's leading the team in sacks. He's going to have to step up even more. Somebody put an APB out for Chandler Jones. He has to get another sack. But honestly, this this is really about their interior defensive linemen stepping up. That people like Jordan Phillips and Zach Allen, like that's where J.J. Watt was, and that's where his presence is definitely going to be missed moving forward. Monica obviously missed tonight against the Packers, but long term, what does this mean for the Cards? I mean, it's well documented, whether you buy it or not, from our hard knocks experience, that J.J. Watt is a terrific leader in the locker room. And even though it, he may not necessarily have blow you out of the water stats, although I'm trying to figure out exactly what that means, he still <laughs> has notched 10 quarterback hits in seven games this year. And so he's not just a leader in terms of the verbal and the presence part. He's actually playing really good football, as we've all said. So I will say, though, if the highest compliment to this Arizona Cardinals squad has been their balance, you – Part of balance is not being solely reliant on one. Right. So I'm curious to see exactly how they make up for this. And June Lee. Yeah, I'm with her and Justin. And I think a, bud, a bunch of the focus now has to go on Chandler Jones, who had five sacks in the opening week, but in 229 snaps since, he has like three tackles. It's one of those things where, where has Chandler Jones gone? He's coming off the COVID list now. He's lost a bunch of weight. Um, and he's one of the most, when he's on, he's one of the more talented defensive players uh, on the line in the NFL. And so I think it's going to be really important for a guy like Chandler Jones to step up in the absence of a J.J. Watt. Quick final word from Nina Kimes. Yeah, not just on the players, but also Vance Joseph, the defensive coordinator, who has been excellent, quietly excellent for two years now for Arizona. He's going to have to come up with ways to generate pressure creatively without J.J. Watt. Absolutely. There's your horn. Quick reset of our scores. Buy or sell is coming up next. I don't even know where the scores are going. I don't have favorites. It's not about where you went to school. 59. People I've known the longest. (laughs) Just totally random. Just totally Definitely random. Know. A lot, a lot to go to 59, though. I do know that. <laughs> He's closer than I am. Around the Horn is presented by DirecTV Stream, part of Happy Hour. James Harden, 14 points, seven boards, and seven assists in Brooklyn's 106-93 loss to the Heat last night. Harden, 15 or fewer points in three straight games for the first time since the 2011-2012 season. Also, the Nets' three losses this season have come by an average of 17.3 points. Start with you, Justin. What are you buying or selling from Harden's struggles this year? I mean, I'm buying the fact that he's clearly out of sync. We know we know prime James Harden, and this is not prime James Harden. He's working himself back in the shape, but you can tell sometimes down the court he's trying to draw those fouls that he got that he's gotten previous years. So Harden, like the rest of the league, is just going to have to learn and adjust. What are you seeing, Monica, from New Look Harden? Um, it's the hamstring. Have y'all forgotten how crazy he looked uh, versus the Milwaukee Bucks the last time we saw this squad? Yeah. Look, I know we joke about what we see out of the offseason runs in L.A. or wherever these guys go. It's supposed to translate, right? Although it doesn't necessarily always. But that's legit. You improve in the offseason. And he didn't have a chance to work on his skills with the changes coming to the rules or not. He's working through his leg injury. Relax. Monica, you mentioned the rule changes. Do you think that's a part of this? Or is this mostly just about not being as aggressive because of that hamstring? I think it's a hamstring sprain. I think the whole rule thing is overblown. If you think that he's going to be significantly slow because of some rules, you've forgotten how talented he is. (laughs) He makes his own rules. Like, that's literally what he's made his name off of. Oh, you got to get two steps? I'll take him backwards then. June, what are you seeing from James Harden? Yeah, I agree. I mean, James Harden's one of the most talented players in the NBA. He's going to be able to adjust to these new rules. I think the the lack of free throws, he has... For the first time since 2011, been uh, won five straight games uh, while average while have, shooting less than five free throws. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a situation where James Harden is coming off of an injury, and he, again, Monica pointed out he looked awful in those NBA Finals. Like this is a significant injury that that he has to work through, and, and the Nets are going to need some time to, to get back to, to full speed. I mean, the Nets don't look good, but James Harden, as a sole proprietor, as a, an entity, as an idea. I don't know what I'm, point I'm trying to make, but James Harden, <laughs> I also don't yeah. look good right now. What's his deal? What's his problem? What's going on? Let's go <laughs> Yeah, both of you have a little bit of, of trouble creating your own shot at the moment. Uh, some of it is obviously the rule change, but I, like my colleagues, I think a lot of it is his health. He's moving at the lowest speed of any player with meaningful minutes in the Ooh. NBA. 
that for me tells a pretty clear story. And as far as the Nets go, it's not just James Harden. They got outscored 31 to 4 on second chances. So you can't just pin this all on James. Anyone want to throw some strays at people who should be really excited they're not moving at the slowest pace in the league? Anyone? No? Okay, we're going to leave them out of this for now. Okay, moving on. Moving on. Brick, air ball, air ball. That was the ugly finish for the Lakers on three straight potential game tying threes. But that didn't matter as much as the fact they blew a 26-point first-half lead and lost to the winless Thunder last night. All that and Russell Westbrook ejected in the final seconds of this game after taking umbrage with the Thunder's Darius Baisley for scoring on a breakaway dunk when the game was already decided. Take a listen. Like that happened, I don't let it slide. The game of basketball, certain things you just don't do. Like in baseball, you know. Bad and certain things you just don't do in, no. in sports. Um, game on your own. And I like it. So, wow. I did not figure Westbrook for a play the right way guy, but here we are. Monica, buy or sell Westbrook's take. Sell! In the game of basketball, there's certain things you don't do. Give up a 26-point lead to a team that's going to be terrible. In the game of basketball, there's certain things you don't do. Allow your teammates to block out so that you can get the rebound to pad your stats because you're on an all-time roll when it comes to double-doubles. So don't give me that. Win the ball game. Then this is not a thing. Oh, boy. Jude, what do you make of Westbrook? I never took Russell Westbrook as an anti basketball right. player. Like, where did that come yeah. from? Like, it's one of those things where it's like... When, when did he become the establishment rule rule enforcer? Like, what happened here? Russell Westbrook was the rebel guy at the beginning of his career. Let the kids play. Yeah, he's got that get off my lawn vibe. Mina Kimes, this is Mr. <laughs> why not, and yet he seems to be telling people, no, these are all the reasons why you should not. What do you make of it? <laughs> I don't think this is about the rules. I think he was just upset with himself. Sarah, there's only two instances in the last 25 seasons of an NBA player turning the ball over 10 times and getting ejected. Ooh. Both are Russell Westbrook. <laughs> Clearly is mad at himself for the turnovers, and I don't blame him, but don't take it out on kids. He has been giving us a history lesson all show. Two times ever, six times in the NFL history. Justin, Westbrook, faux pas here on, on trying to bring in the bat flipping to excuse his actions. I, I I I hate the fact that he's an anti bat flipper. That is that that breaks my heart. And I love <laughs> Russell Westbrook, but he's tripping, man. He is big time tripping. Like the only reason he did that is because again they blew a twenty six point lead, and he had a quadruple double right. with turnovers. Yeah, and you never want to have a quadruple double with turnovers. Yeah. And the fact that the Lakers were two hundred thirty when lead, leading by twenty five points, and now they're two thirty and one. Mm. Like it, it's bad. It's bad. Quick spin to you, Monica. Level of concern on this Lakers start overall. This start has been a little rockier than I anticipated, but overall, I'm not particularly concerned. I think that they'll be a playoff team, but this is an older squad, and we do know that vets tend to part of happy hour. Showdown. Two panelists enter. Only one earns the time that is face. First, Nick Sirianni, master of the metaphor. There's growth under the soil. I, I, I put a picture of a, a flower up, right? And that it's, and it's coming through the ground and the roots are growing out. And the only way the roots grow out every single day and they grow stronger and they grow, they grow better is if that we all put our, we all water, we all fertilize. All right, Nina, does he have a point or is this a bunch of fertilizer? <laughs> Uh, I'd like to him to <laughs> fertilize some Miles Sanders carries personally, but the person who should be worried is Jalen Hurts because all this flower talk and who's his backup? Gardner Minshew? Whoa, mind blown. Monica. Um, I'm impressed that Mina took that to football. I was just going to give a demonstration of a flower coming up from the earth and so that I could add to the uh, the presence of the uh, metaphor. Oh, great. There you so go. So we have uh, intellectual take versus physical comedy. Mina's leading. Let's move on to number two. Last night in Portland, Dyron Asprias bicycle kick goal in the Timbers win over San Jose. Y'all, this is not the first time he's made a goal look wheelie good because he recycled this move from a few years ago. Mina, Aspria in a different gear last night. Monica, you want to pump the tires on this? Goal of the year? Goal of the decade? What are you calling it? This is definitely the goal of the year, Spain. This is incredible. I mean, we really need to respect our athletes' ability to do things that defy gravity. And honestly, it is the most memorable goal that I have personally seen this year. So goal of the year. Sure how many you've seen, Mina? I, I, I gotta agree. <laughs> 
Yeah, goal of the year for me. James Harden should talk to this guy about creating his own shot, by the way. Uh, what makes it so incredible is the range. You don't usually see bicycle kicks from that far out. It's unbelievable. I'm going to go with uh, Mina Kimes, even though you both should lose points for not saying someone from the Red Stars had the game, the goal of the year. It was just that easy. Mina Kimes is your winner. Take the face time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So Kyler Murray, who is playing tonight, private guy, which is why I really enjoyed Josh, Wein- Josh Weinfuss's story today on ESPN.com about Kyler revealing more of his personality through gaming, including the fact that he apparently hates avocados. Quotes, thinks they're green and mushy, which sets up a potential avocado bowl in the NFC Championship if we get Kyler versus Tom Brady. On this one, I'm kind of Team Brady. I like Mm. avocados. You just got to prepare them the right way. Team team avocado for me, for sure. I don't know if I can go Team Brady, but Team avocado. Halloween spectacular tomorrow. See ya. Ooh, it's so close. Happy Hour is presented by DirecTV Stream.